I'll, I'll take the homework because I'm going to grade them now. Okay. So. <laughs> Hi, Mom. I miss you. I hope your GRE experience was a pleasant one. Okay, I'm done. Those are the homeworks. What? Okay. Hi. So, who has been neglected in the past few lectures? Uh, Riemann. Riemann, okay, we have to fix this, right? It's been too long without a theorem of Riemann, right? Yeah, it's going to be back and forth between Riemann and Cauchy as to who does the most. Uh, my kids have a book that they love, Shock versus Train. Which one is better? <laughs> they have all these different competitions between Shock and Train. If you want, I will try to go and get it from the library and read it before class. Uh, we could do Cauchy versus Riemann, okay? And so today, Riemann strikes back. I, there are three <laughs> types of singularities. And in order of increasing badness, there's removable, there's pole, and there's essential. So a removable singularity is one that doesn't really exist. So let me give you an example. I don't know if the book actually gives an example of a removable singularity. I think it just talks about removable singularities, but does it actually give you an example? I think so. Okay, it does? Okay, I might have missed it. So consider f of z is z minus 1 over z squared minus 1. Okay? Where does the denominator blow up? Okay, when z equals 1 or... <coughs> negative one, it blows up. But the singularity at one is not that bad. Because I can remove the singularity at one, and I can write this as z minus one over z minus one, z plus one, one over z plus one. So I can't do anything about the singularity at minus one. But I can do something about the singularity at one. And so we would say that this has a removable singularity at one, and it would not have a removable singularity at minus 1. You might want to say that must mean that the singularity at minus 1 is an essential singularity because it cannot be removed. No. We reserve essential for something else. Okay? Pole just means f of z is the sum, n goes from minus n to infinity, of a n z minus z naught to the n, where n is less than infinity. So for a pole, you only have finitely many negative terms in the Taylor series expansion. We frequently call it the Laurent series expansion to just emphasize the fact that we allow negative powers. <coughs> but you don't have infinitely many negative powers. So what do you think an essential would be? So probably infinitely many. Now of course the question is, when would something with infinitely many make <coughs> sense? So here's a great example. Let's let f of z be e to the 1 over z. What's the only value of z where this is horrendous? Zero. Z equals 0. So we're OK if z is not 0. All other values of z are fine. And we can actually do a Taylor series expansion. And the Taylor series for e to the u converges absolutely for all values of u. Now if I put in z equals 0, I get 1 over 0, e to the, okay, blows up. If I try to expand it, I would have the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of 1 over z to the n over n factorial. Uh, well, that would be a sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of 1 over n factorial z to the negative n. So I would have infinitely many <coughs> terms. Okay. So this does not mean every essential singularity has infinitely many negative <coughs> terms, but it does give you an example with infinitely many negative terms that has an essential singularity. This singularity causes incredibly strange behavior. So I figured, rather than go through all the you know, theoretical stuff, let me jump to a punchline. Okay? What does this have to do about understanding complex functions? So let's say f is holomorphic on C, f misses two points. So if you look at the image of f, there are at least 
two points that it misses. Does anybody know what this means about f? There's only one. I'm sorry? It's not no, I'm telling you it's entire. It's not continuous. It's I'm sorry? It's not continuous. Well, if it's entire, it's differentiable, so it's continuous. It's the nicest type of function. What's the simplest kind of holomorphic function? Constant. Constant. Can somebody give me a real valued function that misses two points and is not constant? Uh, you can define a function like that. Can't you? Yeah, give me, like, give me an infinitely differentiable real valued function that misses at least two points. Sine. Sine. Good. Not even close <coughs> to true in R. Think sine of x. Think e to the x, e to the negative x squared, 1 over 1 plus x squared. Lots of functions miss at least two points. In complex analysis, if you are differentiable and defined everywhere and miss at least two points, then you must be constant. What if you miss three points? Plus your points. Super constant. Yeah. <laughs> Four points. Plus your Four points. Also constant. So how many of you have ever seen Name That Tune? The show. The show. So they have variants of this now. You know, they give you a clue and they say, I can name that song in four notes. I can name that song in three notes. And then whoever says the lowest number is given that many notes of the song to try to guess. Okay? I told you it misses two points. It must be constant. What's the next generalization? I'm sorry? If it misses two or more points? Well, two or more points we just did. You know, if it misses two points and it's it constant... One, it one. So what do you think happens if it misses one point? Does it have to be constant? You know, this is, we're now playing name that function. You know, if I give you a function that misses two points, I can name that function. It's a constant. What if it misses just one? If f misses only one point, what do you think? Can you give me a constant function? I'm oh, sorry, can you give me a function that's not constant that misses only one point in its image? It's a function you've all seen. Sine x over x. Nope. Not a bad try. <laughs> related to sine of x over x, and actually related to something on the board right now. 1 over 1 plus z, you've got to be very careful in terms of that. That actually is not holomorphic everywhere. So what's one of the most important functions we have? E to the negative x squared. Okay, so just, but just e to the z. <coughs> just okay. e to the z. What value does this miss? Zero. Zero. It doesn't have to be constant. You can miss one point. More generally, e to the g of z, where g is holomorphic. What's the one point that this will miss? Zero. Zero. And of course, I could shift things. I could add 5 to this, and now the one point it misses would be 5. Yeah. Why yeah. are you thinking that it misses 0? Like so no matter what value you, you put in for z, e to the z is never 0. So, here's a function that misses one point. It misses the point zero. Zero is not in the image. The function does not have to be constant. If I added five, if I wrote five plus e to the z, it would miss the point five. So, it's possible to miss one point and have no, and only have a partial idea of what the function is like. But interestingly, you can prove it has to look like e to the g of z. That if you miss exactly one point, you have to be the exponential of a holomorphic function. This is extremely nice in terms of giving us a classification of functions. And there will be times when we will use facts like this. All right, so it's time to get Riemann on the board, literally, and talk about removable singularities. So the first one is going to be, when can I remove the singularity? Well, if I write something like this, it's kind of clear I can just look at this and remove the singularity. So the question is always going to be, what conditions? So, Riemann's 
theorem on removable singularities. <coughs> so the question is, what was the key feature here that allowed <coughs> us to remove the singularity at z equals 1? There's a lot of ways to look at it. Well, well one thing is simple. We had this factor. We don't want to have a condition like factor in the statement of our theorem, because that would require us to know how to factor our function. We don't want that as an input to the theorem. So the question is, can we look at a consequence of the factorization? I'm sorry? Right, but that's again the same as factorization. And again, we could definitely form you know, the Math 372 theorem on removable singularities with a factorization condition. <coughs> the question is, how useful would that be? It would require us to be able to factor things. As a number theorist, I can tell you it's very hard to factor. Multiplying is no problem, but factoring is hard. But of course, this is a pure math class. Factoring doesn't mean we actually have to give the factors, just that we have to prove that a factorization exists with certain properties. So it's not as unreasonable as you might think to try a factorization approach. But it's not going to be the right way. What if we, like, does, if, if we get, like, we get an indeterminate form if we plug the number in? So like zero over zero? Right, well, we have an indeterminate form over here as well. Oh, okay. And so it's not just an indeterminate form. But what can you say about this quantity as z gets closer and closer to 1? It's still well defined. It's still well defined. So this is the <coughs> condition that we want to isolate. So one possibility is that you know, the limit exists as z goes to 1 and is finite. Well, if the limit exists, that's essentially telling us it's removable and here's what you should remove it to. Right? So that's too strong of a condition. So we'd go somewhere in between. What if we just assume that it's bounded as we get closer and closer and closer to the point? That's not enough to immediately say the limit exists, but at least tells us that there's a chance that the limit could exist. So I hope you see now that this is why <coughs> this boundedness is a natural condition. It's somewhere in between being able to completely factor and knowing that the limit exists. So what we'll assume is f is polymorphic on an open omega, except possibly at z0. <coughs> assume f is bounded in a disk. about z0. So why am I assuming only boundedness in a disk near z0? Why am I not just assuming f is bounded everywhere? It's too strong. It's too strong. So why is it too strong? We don't need it to be. Yeah, we don't need it to be. Right? And in fact, if my, if my function is defined everywhere, if I assume it's bounded everywhere, then by Liouville it's constant. Right? I want to have as large of a class as functions as possible. All that I really care about is what's going on near Z0. I don't care what's going on far away from Z0. So I want to have local conditions. I only need boundedness near Z0. I don't need boundedness everywhere else. Then we have a removable singularity and f of z is 1 over 2 pi i the integral over c f of zeta over zeta minus z d zeta. <coughs> Where c is a circle in omega enclosing z naught. So where have we seen that integral before? Cauchy. Okay. So the only difficulty is if we want to use Cauchy's theorem, we need to have f holomorphic in the entire disk. We have f is holomorphic in the <coughs> disk, except possibly at one point. But we have that the function is bounded. So the question is, is this enough to allow us to tweak the proof of Cauchy and still get this nice integral representation? If yes, what do you think the value should be of, z, of f at z0? If it's a removable singularity, let's remove it and tell me what I should put there. The limit? Yeah, just put in z naught. And in fact, this integral will be very well defined. 
because on the boundary of the circle, your f of zeta is well defined. Zeta is on the boundary of the circle, so it's going to be far away from z naught. So I'm not going to be dividing by zero. The limit will exist. All right, and so the proof is basically proof by picture. So here is z naught. Here's a point z. <coughs> if you have a really good imagination, here's my circle. I come down and I do what I've been doing all along. And so, you know, I take one of my toy contours like this. And in here, everything is fine, and my <coughs> function is holomorphic. So what can you say if I integrate my function about this whole contour? Zero. I get zero. And now, if you think about what's going on, my contour is oriented like these. These two will cancel in the limit. I'm going about this circle the wrong way. I come down here. I go about this circle the wrong way, and I come back. So in the limit, as the thickness here goes to zero, I'm going to replace my integral over this whole piece, plus this, plus this, will equal zero. Okay? So what do we get? I'll call this C, I'll call this gamma sub Z, I'll call this gamma sub Z naught. And Maybe I'll put a minus sign here to remind myself that I'm going about these circles in the wrong direction. So I get the integral over c, 1 over 2 pi i, of f of z d. Uh, how do I do this? I'll do f of zeta over zeta minus z. Zeta Now, be very careful. So when we integrate over this whole thing, what do we need to do to get zero? We have to include these two integrals as well, right? So we also have a plus one over two pi i integral over negative gamma z, f of zeta over zeta minus z, um, d zeta, plus one over two pi i integral over negative gamma z naught, f of zeta over zeta minus z d zeta, and that all equals zero. Well, if that all equals zero, then this equals this plus this. Right? So, you know, I'm writing almost exactly the same thing now on this line, f of zeta over zeta minus z d zeta, and now when I bring these over to the other side, I lose the negative orientation. They're now oriented correctly. So I get 1 over 2 pi i integral over gamma of z, f of zeta over zeta minus z d zeta, plus 1 over 2 pi i integral over gamma z naught, f of zeta over zeta minus z d zeta. Well, this is exactly what I want to get at the end. So I have two pieces. One of them I want to be f of z, one of them I want to be zero. Which piece do you think is going to be zero in the limit? The peak that doesn't have that point. Okay, so is it going to be the gamma of z or the gamma of z naught? The v, the v, right? No. The gamma of z is the one that's going to contribute. But how are you going to, okay. So, why is this going to be small? Remember, zeta for the third integral, where does zeta live? On which circle? Oh, the, where f is bounded? <laughs> well, f is bounded in the whole disk. So the numerator here is bounded. What about the denominator? Could the denominator go to zero on this small circle about z naught? No. No, because no. we're subtracting z. Z and z naught are separated. So because z and z naught are separated, zeta minus z is bounded from above and below. So if it's bounded below, its reciprocal can't be too large. The numerator can't be too large. And what's the perimeter? It's real small. Really small. 2 pi epsilon, something tending to 0. So the third piece won't contribute. So perimeter goes to 0, 
f of zeta is bounded, and 1 over the absolute value of zeta minus z is bounded. So because of this three facts, the third piece doesn't contribute in the limit. All we needed here was the boundedness of the function f. We didn't need to know anything about the limit. We didn't need to know that the limit exists as we approach z0. But we do need to know that near this point z0, the function is somewhat well behaved. If you've heard of Lipschitz conditions for differentiability, you know, Lipschitz is weaker potentially than being differentiable. Essentially, that's what we need here. We don't need the full strength of continuity. We just need boundedness. If we assume continuity, it's not going to be hard to figure out how to define the function at z0 if the function is continuous. Take the limit. Right? That's why we need something weaker. Now the question is, what is this interval going to be? Well, now we're integrating f of zeta over zeta minus z d zeta about a small circle centered at z. Whose theorem is this? Cauchy's theorem. So yes, even though this is Riemann's theorem on removable singularities, you do have to give you know, credit to Cauchy. This is just f of z by Cauchy's theorem. That's a Hollywood in Cauchy. By Cauchy's theorem. And that finishes the proof. And so now we have the you know, 1 over 2 pi i integral over the closed circle f of zeta over zeta minus c d zeta is f of z, which is what we wanted to show. So if we are bounded in the neighborhood of a singularity, then there's a way to extend the definition of the function and remove that and actually have the function holomorphic everywhere. One of the most important things to learn in looking at subjects like this is how results will generalize. Now in some sense we're generalizing results from real analysis. But in a very special way because now when we say a function is differentiable that implies a lot. How would you generalize complex analysis? So we went from a function from the real numbers to a function from the complex numbers. What would come next? So one possibility is if you know about things like the Hamiltonians, you could go, or the Quaternions, you could try to go that route. Another possibility is to consider functions of two complex variables. And then a lot of these theorems become very different in two <coughs> variables. You know, removable singularities becomes a very different subject. In one dimension, if I want to walk from here to the wall, you know, I'm stuck, you know, unless I actually start really pushing this table, right? I can't get around it. In two dimensions, it's actually very easy for me to walk around this table. In three dimensions, there's also another way to walk around the table. If my cell phone wasn't here, I might try jumping up and seeing what happens. But Geometry greatly affects the solution. It greatly affects what you're able to do. And so here, in one dimension complex, that's two dimensions real, the notion of differentiability gives you an enormous amount to work with. When you start going into two dimensions of complex variables, you know, the question becomes, how will that generalize? What results will I have now with my law? You know, if it's differentiable in two complex variables, there's now so many different ways I can approach things. What's that going to do to the subject? <coughs> so I strongly urge people, if you want to do a research project or some kind of looking where things go, looking further into a topic, and presenting it to the class before the semester is over, one great thing to do is to look at some of the results of complex but, uh, several complex variables. What happens when you have several possibilities? There will also be lots of choices in dynamical theory, in fractals, in number theory, but you, know, you want to get to the point where you can give talks. When I was a graduate student at Princeton, I was applying for an NSF fellowship, and I needed a lot of recommendation within a week or two of arriving at Princeton. No professor really knew me that well. One of my professors gave me the problem of, well, here, here's something I don't know about why don't you read up on it and give a presentation to me? And this is a way for me to then at least write about how well you can learn mathematics. I'm not entirely convinced that he didn't know the material to begin with. Uh, he's a Fields medalist and he had absolutely no trouble seeing the key step, you know, 15 things down as soon as I started writing the conditions. Oh, so this follows from... Yes? 
But it was a really good skill to, you know, can you read something technical and can you present the key points? And again, a lot of you will be doing colloquia. That's another great way to do stuff like this. But if you would like to give presentations in the class, I think it would be a terrific use of your time. And by all means, you know, you can do that in a small group. Okay. So, one down, two to go. Right? We've done, we've removed removable singularities. The next thing is, well, what happens if we have a pole? So I'm not going to go through the proof, but the book has a nice theorem. And so, F has a pole, and as always, F is holomorphic on an open set omega. Okay, so F is going to have a pole at Z dot, if and only if F of Z goes to infinity as Z goes to Z naught. Does that seem reasonable? What are you thinking? When you think of a function that has a pole, you think of like 1 over z minus z naught to the n, maybe 1 over z, 1 over z to the fifth. And as z goes to 0, yes, that's going to go to infinity and absolute value. And it turns out the converse is the case. Now, do we know any functions that blow up that do not have a pole that have something worse? So I've just erased it. What's our function that's worse than a pole? E to the 1 over z. So check e to the 1 over z. So what can you tell me about e to the 1 over z as z goes to 0? Depends on the direction. It's got to depend on the direction. It can't be going to infinity, or it would have to have a pole. So I can think of four good directions. Can somebody give me a good direction? along the real line, be more specific. Right. From the right. If z equals x is greater than 0, get e to the 1 over x, and what does that go to? As x goes to 0 through the positive numbers, what do you get? Plus infinity. Yeah. <coughs> Alright. If z equals x is less than 0, you get e to the 1 over x, and what does that go to? 0. That goes to zero. Let's do one more. If z equals iy, get <coughs> e to the 1 over iy, which is the same as e to the negative i over y. And what do you know about that number? It oscillates. It oscillates. How badly does it oscillate? In what regime? What can you say about the size of this? I'm sorry? It's bounded by one. Bounded by one. Oscillates. Bounded by one. Okay? So whenever you have a theorem, you always want to check some you know, cases against it. You know, here's something that should not you know, be a consequence of this theorem. Let's see what happens. <coughs> and so here's a function where the behavior depends on how you approach. Do we like functions? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to ask personal preferences. Um, it's very convenient to have functions where it doesn't matter how you get there. Uh, who are my physicists again? Okay. You'd really hate to lose conservative forces, right? It's very nice to have a system where it doesn't matter how I get there. This function matters. Now, if you look at this, this is quite interesting in terms of what you get. I come at it one way, I can get arbitrarily large numbers. I come at it another way, I can get towards zero. I come another way, I can oscillate between minus one and one. A lot is happening. What's one number that I never get? Maybe I'm sorry? That's not a number. Maybe infinity. Negative infinity is not really a number. No, one. I, don't know I, can, I can get one by choosing <coughs> special values of y. I can get one. Right. Yeah. Can somebody give me a value that I can't get? Minus two. I'm sorry. Minus two. Okay, so how would we get minus two? <coughs> so 
So is there a way to get minus 2? So can e to the 1 over x equal minus 2 for x near 0? Do you want to do minus 2 or do you want to do 2? Minus 2. Okay. All right, so I want to try to solve this. Right? So how would I write this? Well, actually, I don't want to write x. I'd write 1 over z for z near 0. So I get e to the 1 over x plus i y. This is e to the 1 over x plus i y, x minus i y over x minus i y. Why am I multiplying by 1 <coughs> other than I like multiplying by 1? Yeah, and now the denominator is going to be real, and now I'm going to get e to the x over x squared plus y squared minus i y over x squared plus y squared. So now I would get e to the x over x squared plus y squared, e to the minus i y over x squared plus y squared. <clears throat> so the question <coughs> is, do we think we can make this equal minus 2? <coughs> Instead of minus 2, will you at least give me changing it to negative e squared? Sure. Alright, will you, you'll, you'll, the class will accept this as a friendly amendment. I'm going to replace 2 with e to the 2. We're accepting this as a friendly amendment. That's telling, because if you give me the number 2, how should I write 2? I should write 2 as e to the natural log of 2. Right? So here, we, we, we can do what you want. I'll just write 2 as e to the natural log of 2. So what we know is we want x over x squared plus y squared to be the natural log of 2. Should there be a minus sign in the Almost sure. Uh, where? Oh yes, I want times negative one. Yes. Hmm. So now I want x over x squared plus y squared to equal the log of two. And again, x and y have to be going to zero. But it looks like that's going to be hard to solve. All right, so let's postpone that for a moment. What's the other thing I need? Well, negative one is e to the i pi. So I want y over x squared plus y squared to be pi. Is it supposed to be pi or minus pi? I'm sorry? Yeah, but I can also write negative 1 as e to the minus i pi. So maybe I'll be a little bit more careful, and I'll say pi plus 2 pi n, where n is an integer. Because I have a lot of freedom in terms of solving that. Right? I need to get negative 1. <coughs> There's lots of ways to get negative 1. I could have pi, I could have minus pi. Okay? This is a long digression, I know, but I think this is a little bit better than just jumping straight into the proof of the theorem. Is to see, can we actually solve this? So the goal... Remember, we want x and y going to 0, 0. We want y, or is it x? x over x squared plus y squared equal the natural log of 2. And we want y over x squared plus y squared to equal uh, 2n plus 1 pi. And if we, if we do that, we get... Then we would get e to the 1 over z does equal negative 2. And then that would give us... And if we can do this, we can probably do anything. Okay. Right? Okay. So now, as x and y go to 0, get smaller and smaller and smaller, the denominator here is going to 0. 
x needs to be going to 0, I think, like y squared. Right? If x is going to 0 slower than the denominator, this is going to go off to infinity. So I'm going to need, <coughs> I might think maybe x, maybe try x equals alpha y squared. So the question is, does this seem reasonable? Yeah, if I do that, you know, I need the numerator and the denominator to be of comparable size to get something like the log of 2. If I do that, I will get alpha y squared over alpha squared plus 1 times y squared equals the log of 2, or alpha over alpha squared mm -hmm. plus 1. I've almost surely made a mistake based on people's response. I think you would get an extra y squared. Yeah, you end up with the y is the in the denominator when you square it, when you put the Oh, square good, square. okay. Yes. So I get alpha y squared over alpha squared y to the fourth plus y squared equals the natural log of 2. Now, as y goes to 0, what does this ratio look like? Alpha. alpha right? This extra y to the fourth is insignificant next to y squared, right? So we get alpha equals the natural log of 2, you know, as y goes to 0. But in this, in this case, since it's in the denominator and y is going to 0, if we take to the fourth power, it's going to be more small. Right, but the denominator is going to look like y squared. If this is 1 over a million, if y is 1 over a million, oh, this I is 1 over a million saying. squared, this is 1 over a million to the fourth. Okay, got it. So as y goes to 0, the denominator will look like y squared. Now again, this would not give us the actual value of uh, negative 2 for any finite y. This would only be in the limit. So if I wanted to do for a specific finite value of y, I would now have to solve this equation. Right? Now I look at this equation over here. y over x squared plus y squared. Do I expect to be able to make that equal 2n plus 1 pi? I'm sorry? I don't think so. Well, you'd, have to use, you'd have to use that alpha value. Right, yeah. right so now we get y over alpha squared y to the fourth plus <coughs> y squared, right? This is equal to 1 over alpha squared y cubed plus y squared. And I want that to be 2n plus 1 times pi. Isn't well, y cubed plus y? Oh, y cubed plus, plus y, yes, y cubed plus y. I've dropped a y. Well, when y is very, very small, this looks like 1 over y, and yes, that will tell me exactly what value of y to take. So, I can find a path where it will be arbitrarily close to negative 2. Okay? So, I have found a path where either the 1 over z, z is approaching 0, and along this strange path, I am going to be arbitrarily close to <coughs> minus 2. I can do this for any number. This is not the same as saying I can find a z where the value is equal to minus 2. But again, good chance I should be able to do that. Again, I chose a very specific value of x here, and I lost a degree of freedom. I have two equations and two unknowns. What should I do? I the first thing I would do here is I'd take the ratio, and I'd get x over y is the natural log of 2 over that. Okay, so I'll leave it as an exercise. Can you solve exactly? And the hint is take ratios. <coughs> and then you would start off with x over y is the natural log of 2 over 2n plus 1 <coughs> pi. So now you can express x in terms of y, and you still have a free variable n. So there's a really good chance you should be able to solve this. This is a very strange function. 
okay? Near the point z equals zero, we've just shown the function is arbitrarily close to any number you want, and in fact, might even hit that number you want, and in fact, might even hit that number you want infinitely many times. Okay? So, you know, take a moment and just try to picture a function that near a point is arbitrarily close to every possible value in the complex plane. These are strange functions. Okay? The behavior near an essential singularity is absolutely wild. Okay? So this means that if we were to travel along a path yes. defined by a ln of 2 something in it, you know, or there is a path basically, there is a path. If we travel along that path to, towards 0, we'll get either 1 over z goes to negative 2? Yes. That's yes. Yeah, so it's being recorded, so you have to watch your language, but yes. <laughs> okay? You can get it to be, a ne there's nothing special about negative 2. I don't have to watch it. Okay? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Uma already knows about your language, so. That's true. <laughs> there's nothing special in this problem about minus 2. I can get arbitrarily close. And so this, uh, my spelling is atrocious, I want to make sure I spell the names correct. Cass. Well, this is, I think there's an A in it. Casarati. Casarati. Viastras. So Viastras is another big gun in the subject. We'll see a lot of his theorems later on. F holomorphic <coughs> on disk. Except in essential singularity at z naught. Let d, I think we're using r for the radius, yeah. r of z naught minus the point z naught be the punctured disk. So I'm basically just removing that one point z naught where things blow up. Okay. Then f of the punctured disk <coughs> is dense in C. So you take any small disk about an essential singularity, look at the image under f of everything but the point where the function is undefined, and you are dense in C. You are arbitrarily close to every point in C. An absolutely wild behavior. And you should be viewing this, thinking back to what I was talking about with these functions that if you miss two points, you're constant. You know, what, do you, what do you mean by dense? <coughs> so uh, what dense means is you give me any point, and I can find a sequence of points that get arbitrarily close to it. So we can play the old epsilon game. You give me an epsilon, and I will give you a point such that I'm within epsilon. So, if this is my punctured disk, and I apply f, and here's the entire complex plane, you give me any point here, and I can give you a sequence of points in here, whose image <coughs> is converging to that point. Yes? Does the sequence of points have to be heading towards Z0? Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be. But there will be a sequence heading towards, you know, because, I mean, again, I can keep shrinking my radius. So it's going to be true, so since it's true, but again, if you just take the point here and look at its image, then I just take a sequence of points converging to here, and that will work. So I don't have to use the essential singularity, but there is a way to do it through the essential singularity. Any Stargate fans here? <coughs> Think of it as a portal that will take you anywhere you want in the complex plane. You can get arbitrarily close any way you want in the complex plane by stepping through an essential singularity. Okay? This is not quite enough for me to justify to Williams, you know, purchasing the entire Stargate series. <laughs> so <clears throat> maybe I have to do a little bit more work on that later. Okay. Proof. Okay? Assume not. So that means there has to be at least one point that I don't get arbitrarily close to. 
So there exists a W in C, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that f of z minus w is always greater than or equal to delta. I'm not able to get closer than delta to that point. Okay? Otherwise, if for every delta, I could find a point that I'm, such that I'm within delta when I apply, I just take delta to be one, then a half, then a fourth, then an eighth, then a sixteenth, and I'd have a sequence converging. Is this taken away up here? Uh, ah, that if you're dense, that it has to have an essential singularity? Yeah. Good question. Um, <coughs> I believe so, but I'm not positive. I'm trying to think, you know, what happens if I give you the function 1 over z? Yes, because we know if it's just a pole, mm -hmm. 1 over z is going to go to infinity. Mm -hmm. And so then you will miss the stuff in the Abram. So yes, it is if and only if. It is if and only if. So assume not, so we have some point, and we're always at least delta away from the point. So consider the function g of z is 1 over f of z minus w. Whenever you see this, what should be your immediate reaction when I write this down? Where is it defined? Is this function defined everywhere? Yes, we're assuming that it's not anywhere near W, so it's defined everywhere. So it's holomorphic, in fact. Holomorphic everywhere. In punctured disk. As Z gets very close to Z naught, this is always going to be at least delta in absolute value down below. So how large is G of Z going to be <coughs> as, as Z gets close to Z naught? 1 over delta at most, or to be safe, maybe 2 over delta, right? So z close to z naught, g of z will be less than or equal to 2 over delta. You put in that little factor of 2 just to be absolutely safe. But in fact, I, we don't actually need it because we're assuming f of z minus w is always greater than or equal to delta. 1 over delta would be fine. I always like to just give myself a little cover over. I've got a holomorphic function on a punctured disk that's bounded near the point z naught. <coughs> Not quite constant. We can't go that far. But where have we seen the situation? Uh, uh, Removable singularity. Right? Bounded. So removable singularity. So, there's a, so we can define g of z naught. So we can define g of z naught, which is 1 over f of z naught minus w. So there's two possibilities. g of z naught is 0. g of z naught is not 0. If this is equal to 0, then we're going to get f of z naught has a finite pole. And if it's not equal to zero, then f is going to be well defined. So case one, g of z naught is not zero implies f of z naught is not and this <coughs> implies f of z naught is defined, z naught is not an essential singularity. So again, imagine g of z naught is 5. Then we get f of z naught minus w is 1 over 5. f of z naught is 1 over 5 plus w. So if g of z naught is non-zero, we can actually define f of z naught, and that's a contradiction. Right? We have an essential singularity. The function blows up there. It's no longer blowing up. So what's the only other case? Case 2, g of z naught equals 0. So we can write g of z is equal to z minus z naught to some power times some function h of z. And if you just plug in what happens, you get f of z is then going to be, you know, putting things over, 
I'm basically going to get something like z minus z naught to the negative m times blah. Right? If this vanishes to order n, when I move things around, I'm going to get its behavior at z naught. I'm going to get a pole of order n. Is a pole of order n an essential singularity? No. Yeah. Contradicts essential singularity. And that's the proof. So we've proved that if you have an essential singularity, the image is dense in the neighborhood of the essential singularity. Extremely wild behavior. Okay? And again, the whole argument was basically, if it's not dense, there's some point that I miss, so I've got to be at least a certain distance away from it, so if I look at its reciprocal, it's now bounded. Now by Riemann's theorem of removable singularities, since it's bounded, I can extend and I have a definition of the function. If it's zero, I'm good. If it's not zero, I'm good. Okay, a lot of stuff today. I will send you notes.